Living at below the poverty line is a harsh reality for many people who are chronically ill. It's not just about the staggering cost of medications, doctors, and treatments. Often, there is a significant loss of income due to the inability to maintain consistent employment. In today's video, I want to talk about the cost of living chronically ill, and I'm going to break down what it costs for me living in Canada with universal health care as well as having private health insurance. I'm also going to try to estimate what this would cost me if I didn't have subsidized health care or health insurance because unfortunately that is the reality of many people who suffer from chronic illness. Hi, I'm Daniela and you are watching Through the Looking Glass where we foster resilience and inspire lives. Today I'll split our discussion into three categories medications, consultations, and treatments. I'm under the care of several specialists for various chronic conditions, including fibromyalgia, chronic migraines, POTS, also known as postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, mast cell activation syndrome, and lately achinlosin and spondylitis. I rely on a range of medications daily, including anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, painkillers, sleep aids, and specific medications for fibromyalgia. Without insurance, these alone would cost a crazy amount. I have to mention that the price of medications here in Canada, though they're not covered by your universal health care, it is subsidized by the government, so it is considerably cheaper than what it will be in the States, for example. Thankfully, my private health insurance completely covers most of these medications, reducing to almost nothing by monthly expenses for managing my illnesses. Anyone who ever needed to use their health insurance knows that they're in the business of making money, not supporting you in your health journey, and so it hasn't always been straightforward. There have been many appeals when they declined coverage of crucial medications to manage my health, as well as they often push for cheapest medication versions. Though generic medications can be a good option, they do vary significantly in their non-active ingredients, which can dramatically affect how your body responds. Okay, so let's take a closer look at my monthly expenses related to these medications, treatments, and consultations. I will break down the cost of each medication, and then at the end, we'll calculate what everything costs yearly. You will be surprised at what it takes to manage these conditions financially. I will then show you what I have to pay out of pocket for managing my conditions. In the medication category, we have first pain management, a crucial part of my daily routine. This category includes four medications. Medication number one, it's an anti-inflammatory. I take it twice a day and it really helps me with my back pain and that costs $10 a month. Medication number two is a muscle relaxant and I take it once a day before bed and that costs $25. Medication number three is for fibromyalgia and I also take it once a day and that one is the most expensive from this category because it has to be compounded and it costs $120 a month. Medication number four is as a needed stronger pain medication and I find that I use an average of 10 a month and that costs about $30. I have also done ketamine infusions for pain. I do every couple of months, so that's about six times a year, but I'll include those in the treatment category. The second medication category tackles allergies and the mast cell activation syndrome. Here, I also take four medications. Medication number one is an age one blocker taken in the morning and it costs $48 a month. Medication number two is an age two blocker and it costs $95 a month. Medication number three is also an age one blocker, but this one I take it at night and it costs $25. Medication number four is a mast cell stabilizer and I take it also on a needed basis. If I took it every day, it would cost me $125 a month, but because my mast cells are well controlled with the other medications, 
this has lasted me the entire year. Then there are two EpiPens which I need whenever the above medications fail and I start to go into anaphylaxis and they need to be replaced annually. So either I use it or not, they expire. Each cost $150 and I have to have two because in an emergency, you might have to administer a second dose before paramedics get to you. Third, we have nausea management. My nausea is often triggered by other conditions, most common migraines or when my pain is out of control, but this includes two medications. The first medication costs about $17 a month and the second medication, which is a bit stronger than the first one, and I only take it when the first one is not working at all, and that costs about $15 a month. Because I don't use these every day, so the costs are based on my average usage. Next, we have the migraine category, both the most expensive and most debilitating condition I have. Here, I rely on medication number one, which is a monthly injection at a shocking cost of $700 a month. This is supposed to prevent me from having migraines in the first place, but I often still average a 15 days a month where I still need to take abortive medications. And that is when medication number two comes in and that costs me $170 a month. Why are migraines medications so expensive? My word, that is ridiculous. And anyone who suffers from migraine knows how debilitating it is. I've also undergone Botox and magnesium infusions for migraine management, which I will cover under treatments. For POTS, I am not currently taking any medication, but in the past I have been prescribed two medications. Medication number one was to increase my blood pressure and it costs $25 a month. And medication number two is to slow down my heart rate and costs $30 a month. I also attend physiotherapy twice a week, which again, I'll include in the treatment category. In the past, I have also been prescribed IV home infusions, but I've never actually needed to do those, so I'm not going to include those in the calculation. But if I did need them, they were prescribed once a week and they cost about $300 to have a nurse come in and hook you up to an IV, infuse, and then leave. For sleep, I manage an alpha delta sleep disorder as well as insomnia with a sleeping pill and that costs me $85 a month. Now let's discuss doctor's consultations. First, my family doctor is the doctor I see the most often. I see her roughly every two months for medication renewals, treatment effectiveness assessment, referral letters, and a lot of insurance paperwork. These visits are covered by our universal health care, so there's no direct cost to me. But without it, the cost would be $50 per visit. However, if you do need forms filled, it's an extra $150 if you have to have an insurance form filled out on top of the $50 visit. Then there are all the specialist consultations. I am under the care of a neurologist, a immunologist, a rheumatologist, and what's the other one? Uh, ophthalmologist. The frequency of these visits vary, but average twice a year for each at a cost of $300 per visit. For the tests category, the one I do most often is definitely blood work. They average about every three months. Depending on what's being investigated, they can cost anything between $100 to $300 per blood draw. So I'll say one at a $300 and then maybe three at $100. Then there are x-rays. Last year I had two and they're each about $50 and then I did two MRIs. I did one MRI uh, because a migraine that I ended up in the hospital and then I did another MRI when I had my eye infection, the uveitis, and I actually just missed an MRI for the ankylosing spondylitis, which it will be 
rescheduled and I'm not quite sure when that will be, but that we're going to push it for 2024 cost. MRI costs about $2,000 each. I also did a CT scan, which I don't really remember what that was for, but I know I did a CT scan and that is a little bit more expensive than the MRI and it costs $2,100. I also did one ultrasound at $360. And I also had to wear a halter monitor for two weeks, and that would have costed me a thousand dollars if I wasn't covered by the universal healthcare here. Now let's break down the treatment category. For migraines, I did four sessions of Botox injections. They each cost about twelve hundred dollars, and my insurance only covered eight hundred out of each of those sessions, leaving me with a $400 out-of-pocket expense. I will no longer be doing those as the insurance will either cover the injections or the Botox, but not both. The Botox wasn't really helping and that's why I started the injections, so it didn't make any sense to continue. They're super painful and they weren't really helping me. I also did magnesium infusions twice in the year, costing $400 each. That was not covered at all by my insurance. For fibromyalgia treatments, the expenses include the ketamine infusions, which I do every couple of months, so six times a year at $800 per session. And then I do massage therapy once a month, which for me is not a luxury, is a necessity, and each hour of massage is $100. In managing POTS, I attend physiotherapy twice a week with each half an hour session costing $50. I should be doing it every week of the year, but in reality, I only do about half the year, especially in the summer when it gets busy with camping and I am more physically active. I just skip on the physio, so I'll just bet into the cost. Now let's talk about a category that often gets forgotten to be taken into account, but can add quite a bit, and that is the miscellaneous or other expenses. And that includes therapy, because we can't forget about mental health. I do therapy twice a month, and each session costs $180. Then there is transportation and parking, which I honestly don't even know what that sums up to, but let me tell you, hospital and medical building parking is not cheap. And we're not even going to touch on loss of income because that is very individual. Some people cannot work at all, some have reduced hours, and some even work full-time but may have to take beyond their given sick days and that ends up costing them out of pocket. Not to mention people who are self-employed and if they don't work, they simply don't get paid. Another one that can come at an insane cost is hospital stay. Because not everybody who's chronically ill has hospital admissions, I would not include that in our calculation, but should be mentioned because my four-day hospital stay last year costed an estimated $20,000 and I didn't even get surgery. These numbers highlight the immense financial impact of chronic illness. It's not just about the direct cost of treatments and medications, but also the ongoing consultations, therapies, time off work, unexpected expenses that add up over time. It paints a vivid picture of the financial realities of living with multiple chronic illnesses. It's not just about managing symptoms, but also managing the financial implications of these treatments. Understanding these costs is vital in recognizing the challenges that many of us face. Sharing this information helps in building awareness and empathy. Okay, so now let's add up everything. Are you ready? This number is shocking. Okay, do me a favor. Pause this video right now and comment what you think this all adds up to. Go ahead. I'll wait. Did you do it? Okay, so let's see how close you got. So first, I'm just going to give you the total for each category. So for medications, it totaled up to $16,565. That is all to manage symptoms. None of this medication is like a cure or a treatment that's going to result on being free from that illness. It's symptom 
management. That's crazy. That is crazy. Then second, we have consultations and that is $2,100. Then for tests, we came to $4,960. Treatments also came to a staggering amount of $11,000. Now I have rounded those amounts to the nearest dollar just to make calculations a little bit easier, but now for the grand total, drum roll please, a grand total of $34,625. I mean, that is some people's entire yearly salary. That is what some people have to live off, to pay their rent, their mortgage, their food, all their expenses. It's just insane that in order for me to have any quality of life, and not be a vegetable in bed crying and moaning every single day, I have to spend almost $35,000. And let's be honest, that is not the reality of the majority of people. I am just so fortunate that I have universal health care and also that I have private insurance that covers the majority of those costs. Now, just out of curiosity, let's break down these by chronic illness. So I'll only include medications and treatments. So let's just see like how much does it cost to manage symptoms for each of the chronic illnesses that I have. So fibromyalgia came at $7,440. And then migraines, the winner in expense, at $12,840. Then we have the mast cell activation syndrome at $2,500 and for POTS, $2,600. Then we have nausea management at $384. I wasn't sure which category to put in because nausea can be a symptom of different uh, illnesses, but if I had to attribute to one, I would say I would put it in the migraine because I think that that's where most of my nausea comes from. And then we have insomnia and that added to $1,020. And again, it's not like, is it a chronic illness? I guess it is. I'm not sure. You are diagnosed with insomnia, so... Maybe it is, but again, I think I would add that to the fibromyalgia if I just had to keep to the other categories because I think it's the fibromyalgia and the pain that keep me up. So understanding these costs is more than just numbers. It's about the real life impact on individuals and families. It's a reminder of the resilience and strength required to manage chronic illnesses every day. And now you're probably asking, Daniela, how much did this really cost you? Because you have universal health care and you have private insurance. So for me, what was not covered by insurance was part of the Botox treatments, which costed me $400 each and I did four sessions, so that was $1,600. And the magnesium infusions, that were $400 each, so that was $800. And they don't cover any of the nausea medication for some reason. So all of that ended up costing me $2,584. That is what I had to take out of pocket for the year of 2023. So this year I am not doing Botox anymore. I am not doing magnesium infusions anymore simply because they did not work for me. So I'm really only left with $384 a year. And I realize how fortunate I am to have this, to be in Canada and have universal health care and to have a good private insurance. Universal health care is not perfect. I waited quite a bit to see uh, a specialist to do my table tilt test for POTS diagnosis. I am still waiting to see a gynecologist for menopausal symptoms. And you could expect an average of 
three to six months wait time to see a specialist unless it is a super emergency. When I first had heart issues, I saw a cardiologist within two weeks and that was like record time for me. I have never seen a specialist so quickly unless you go to the emergency room and then obviously you will be seen there. But an out of hospital consultation usually takes three to six months but it can potentially, especially during time of COVID, it was taking a year to a year and a half. So it has its downside, but when you look at $35,000 a year to be reduced to 350, I, I can't complain. I really can't complain. And I cannot imagine people who live in a country where don't have universal healthcare, they can't afford health insurance because that's the other thing too. We are fortunate that this health insurance is through my husband's work who works full time because it's really difficult to get a private health insurance if you're not working full time. And so there's this added cost monthly as well that I didn't take into account because first of all, we paid for a family premium. So I don't even really know how much that would be my share maybe $100, $150 a month, considering everything that I don't have to pay for me is totally worth it. Through sharing and awareness, we can support each other in this journey. So thank you so much for watching and spending this time with me. If you have any questions, don't be shy. Just ask them in the comments and I will answer. Sometimes it takes me a few days or a week, but I always answer. I will see you in the next one.